Good afternoon. My name is Will Barton. I wanted to say thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, just a few things about myself. I'm horrified to say I've now just completed a 50-year career in the chemical industry, holding positions up to Vice President of Manufacturing and Technology, worked in the UK, the US and Belgium. For the last 15 years, however, I've been working in and with early stage um, companies in the chemicals and materials space and also alongside that on an enabling innovation processes with Innovate UK, the High Value Manufacturing Catapult and a similar organisation in the Republic of Ireland. Now, before we move on today, just a few things for you all to note. First of all, um, you're, you're all going to be on mute throughout this process. Um, if you've got questions, you should type them in to the question box, which you should see. Um, any time during the process. We're going to leave the question and answer session until after both speakers have uh, given their talks. So we'll have a facilitated Q&A at the end. But do put your questions in as we go along because there'll only be one or two minutes at the end of the second presentation um, to put any more questions in. And we've got Tom Harrison um, from, the, um, from the SCI who's around to um, to facilitate that Q&A for you. You should be able to see a picture of Tom on the screen there now. So thank you for joining this second in the series of three um, programmes on digital design. It's taking us on the development journey to chemical products, exploring the enabling technologies now available to increase business productivity. We started with a, a webinar on di digital design of molecules and formulations we had that back in July. Today, we've got a webinar on design and operation of chemical processes. And then in October, we have one on the digital design of life cycles where we track materials along the supply chain. This series is being supported by the Chemistry Council's Innovation Committee, which is a government sponsored group of leaders from the chemistry using industries who discuss the future developments of the industry one of which, of course, is driven by innovation. And within innovation, the um, use of AI, data and digitalization are really key themes for us. Today, we are delighted to welcome to speak to us um, Professor Ian Crosley, who is the founder of Sea Futures, and Sophie Duffield, who is a senior scientist in the modeling core team at uh, GSK. They're going to describe digital approach, approach, approaches to existing processes, to the design of new processes, and within that, the, the idea of de developing digital twins to simulate changes before implementing them in practice. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Ian Crosley. Ian is an experienced CEO with a demonstrated history of working in the industrial engineering sector He's a strong business development professional with a proven track record in research and development, engineering management, process engineering and simulation. Ian is passionate about excellence and manufacturing excellence and growth through the adoption of data driven manufacturing technologies and reaching the net zero emissions goals through collaboration, research, technology demonstrators and stopping jargon based exploitation. Ian has been appointed as an honorary professor at the University of Central Lancashire and is also a member of the advisory board for the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre, which is a part of the High Value Manufacturing Catapult. So, Ian, welcome to you. Hey, thank you, uh, Will, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to start off by just saying that before I go through the presentation, there's a couple of things that I um, really don't like to use and phrases I like to use. One of these is um, industry four, and the second one is apps. So for those two reasons, I'm going to just explain a little bit first. I feel that industry four, when we talk about our industry, we talk about how we um, can enable digital in there, it can be quite difficult for people to understand it without having an association of costs to it, and normally high costs. They see big signs in pounds, dollars, euros, yen, or whatever. And the second one is in terms of apps. I tend to find that people 
like apps on the phone, they like them for their social interaction and doing that. But when it comes to work, they prefer to talk about solutions, which are much more robust, much more reliable, much more industrially acceptable. So I'd just like to make that distinction. And I will mention these a little bit as we go through the presentation, but please bear that in context. So we get to why do we drive a digital transformation? And the summary of that really is for competitive advantage. So most companies have a good market position. They have well known in their brand. They have price and quality, often driven by the market, but always driven by shareholder expectation and shareholders want more. So when you start to look at those things, how can you get more from what you have and how you go about it? And it's looking at things like, how can we get more throughputs? How can we get better quality? more reliable, properly reduce waste, but most importantly, increase profit and make our sustainable businesses. These are all drivers which we're aware of and have been around for some time, but we're now being faced by some even more unknown challenges. And one of the reasons we're all sat where we are now, is COVID-19, and the second one, which is rapidly approaching, is going to be Brexit, all of which are going to have an impact on our businesses, how we do business, and how the chemical industry goes forward. And sure, the bottom phrase there, uncertainty, is a new certainty in the chemicals industry. And this is going to be something that's more and more challenging as we continue our journeys. Just a couple of quick facts here. And one of these is an absolute amazing thing that 5.5 million new things are connected to the internet every day. And there'll be a total connection of 50 billion by 2020. 50% of the world's data was created last year, but less than 5.5% of that was analysed or used. So that shows that there's a huge trend to collect data. There's a huge movement where people are actually understanding the value of data. However, how it's being used is very questionable. And when you consider how much it costs to collect data, it can be a highly valuable commodity, but unless you're actually analysing it, may become a burden. So looking to how we can adapt and apply digital technologies to what we do, it looks at the way that we bring products to market. So this is from formulation, from design, from designing the processes, how we actually make those products and also how those products evolve. So when those products go into the marketplace, how those products can be used, how information from those products can be collected, and how we can understand how they're being utilised and where they are, maybe in supply chains, maybe in their life cycle. And also, perhaps it helps us look at how we can adjust our supply chains and how we can do it. So when we look at the way products come to life, we're talking very much about application of techniques like generative design, where we can do fast changes, fast analysis, fast reduction. We can have a look at a lot of intelligent models which shortcut the processes. And we get to an ecosystem which could be defined as a system of systems. In terms of the way that products are made and the way that that changes, there's a lot of new technologies out there. There's an awful lot of hype around some of these, but some of them are very, very valuable. And one of the things that is valuable is to stop human beings doing processes and jobs that they're bad at. So if it's a repetitive process, which is boring, and loses people's engagement, it's a very good idea to look at these type of technologies to avoid that ability. And obviously, when a product out there, the amount of data that can be collected from the product, from the processes and systems around it can be huge. And there can be an awful lot of insight gained from that. I'm showing you a slide now from Henrik von Schiel, who is pretty much acknowledged as the father of Industry 4. And if you look at this, it's arranging a whole range of technologies and a whole array that can be put together, which really is looking at how we connect physical world, the digital world, and the virtual world. Now, again, when I said at the start, Industry 4 can be quite scary when you look at the complexity and the interactions here. It can become very strange. It can become a little bit, where do I start? And it become a little bit disjointed almost in the application of it. But on this graph, the things that are interesting are, Industry 3 was identified in 1969. In Industry 4, starting at 2013, you can see it's an exponential increase to 
2020 where we are now and beyond. So time to changing and changing fast. If we look at this split into the different waves, and each of these waves will be a disruptor. The first wave, a range of a lot of technologies which are fairly well known and applied in some manufacturing industries more than others. But the Institute for Manufacturing at Cambridge University have recently done a study, and what they've realized is that the first wave is probably five to six years behind where it should be. So this shows that the adoption of these technologies isn't as fast as people have expected, and it isn't as fast as the experts in the field had hoped or were hoping to see changes from. And a lot of this can be to do with the mindset of industry and the fact that there needs to be a lot of investment to map this and to understand it, and it is a changer. But I think the key to it is digital is quite a way behind where it should be. For me, one of the greatest things about digital is it's an enabler of the circular economy. And for me, the circular economy is very, very important as we look to sustainability, we look to trying to provide a better environment. And also we try to drive towards our net zero goals. So going from the linear economy of use, dispose, recreate, and take it to this circular economy is very, very important. And because digital makes you think about the processes you use, how you use those processes, and what those processes actually can do and how they can be changed is very, very important. So if we look at industry three, this is really a connection between the process, sensors, actuators, the control, manufacturing management systems, and planning and logistics. So this is a lot further than a lot of SME companies are and quite a lot of established companies. So what Industry 3 is giving is great visibility of the process and the operation. If you look to the right of this slide, when we talk about Industry 4, this is actually looking at your supply chain, so your materials coming in, the components that are used, as well as the manufacturing part of it, which is covered in the Industry 3, but it's also looking going out beyond this at logistics and connection to the customer. So whilst this is a very nice system to have, it may not be absolutely valuable to everybody. But for sure, getting to an Industry 3 stage or Industry 3 Plus is very, very valuable. But there are a lot of challenges in this. And those challenges I regularly categorize as the five Ps, which are people, plants, process, products, and profit. And they're all important in this journey and how we go about it. And it's something to consider all the way through any processes you're thinking about and any projects you're thinking about is how you engage all those different sectors. And for each person, the challenge will be different. So if we take the ideal factory environment, we've probably got a factory that's been designed using 3D, maybe VR, maybe other techniques. It's designed specifically for a purpose, so efficiency and movement is important. The processes will probably be highly automated. So as well as having a digital design, it's got a digitally designed control system, which can be incorporated into that. And what this means is all the information is available in one central spot, and it's very easy on a greenfield application to actually drive this digital change and get the benefits from the process. So in a nice, clean environment, this is an ideal situation to have, and it means that we can get to paperless systems very, very easily. We can actually understand what's going on in our processes, and we can see how we can improve the operation and our bottom line efficiencies. The reality is slightly different. The majority of companies are located on non-ideal sites or reutilized sites, They're using aged assets, which are often modified. They're using control systems, which in a lot of cases aren't digital, they're analog systems, maybe even old relay logic systems in some cases. To make it worse, a lot of these systems have been modified quite heavily. And the data that exists around these systems and the information is often 2D information, maybe not digital and out of date. 
However, when we look at the systems and we analyze the systems and people talk about those systems, we have a whole array of green lights available, which mean that the system is operating correctly and is operating within parameters that we expect and producing as well as we can expect. The other element in here is the operator. And for this case, I'm going to call him Billy. And Billy understands how this process operates, how it works. He has lived and worked with this all his life. He understands all its idiosyncrasies, how to cure them and how to get the best out of that process. Part of the problem though going forward is Billy's knowledge is going to be limited by time because eventually he's going to retire. So when we start to look at aged assets, it really is a lot more complex how we go about these projects and where we go. So on that basis, it's important that we consider a structured approach. And the start of this journey and this digital journey is really the creation of a digital strategy. And to get the benefits of this digital strategy with a whole host of techniques that are available out there, it's important that you capture the understanding and knowledge you have of your industry or domain knowledge. An important part that's put into it. If people aren't aware of the technologies that are available to them and how they can be used and integrated into their operations, it's well worth working with somebody to try and get that understanding. So these can be the high value manufacturing catapults, it could be the made smarter projects which are going ahead. They could be some of the LEP run systems, for example, in Liverpool, LCR 4.0. These are all people who've got great expertise who can bring something to the table, help you with developing this digital strategy. So that's stage one in this journey. Stage two is you actually have to understand the processes that you're operating, the systems that you're operating are working well. Because if these systems aren't operating, all that's going to happen is you're going to take a poorly performing system and digitize it still see a poorly performing system so it really needs a health check i'll call it but also understanding the plant understanding the upgrades understanding instrumentation that needs adding into that and also understanding if the data that's in that process at that time will substantiate improvements and improve the process for you moving on from that to the third stage is how you then start to connect this and bring these systems together. Four is how you share that information and push this across your company, your group of companies, your employees. Five is looking at additional benefits in here. So looking at analytics, looking at rules engines, looking at optimization tools, and how you actually report the results out of these and do it. So this is actually starting to look at how you utilize the system to see the benefits of it. And as you move on from that, it goes into more and more complex systems. So eventually you can take these systems and end up looking at the digital twin, which can be a very bespoke application for the business and for its advice, and also giving you a lot of prediction as well as maintenance and training capabilities. So it's a long journey, but for a lot of people, understanding what's available, understanding their processes systems and where good investment can be made is the start point. The rest of it follows. So when we start to look at digital applications and digital projects, we need to have a range of ideas and we need to actually structure what we're trying to do. So a lot of the common challenges are listed here and they're things we know. So we're looking at energy usage, machine efficiency, uptime, waste. These are typical things we need to do. But the approach that I advocate is a three-stage one. And it's really understand, monitor, and control. Understand is getting an in-depth sight into your processes, how those work, the interactions of those processes, and what's needed to control them well. The monitor is then automating that understanding so that you can actually measure, measure this against KPIs, and ultimately the control is automating that response. And that automation can either be as a closed loop system or as an open loop advisory system. But the whole point is it has to be understandable, it has to be validatable, and it has to be of benefit. And the benefits industry are a lot around the energy usage, a lot around reduction of costs, and most importantly, the sustainability aspects, how those can be driven. 
So if we look at an example here, of a contract manufacturing system and its life cycle, there are a whole range of discrete activities that take in place here. What I'm going to look at here particularly really is the manufacturer and the analytical testing and product release. But at the end, you can see how these tie together into a system that is designed specifically around these processes. So when we start this journey and we start, we start at the very base level by looking and trying to understand how equipment works and how interconnected equipment works, how the interconnected equipment works as a process, how that needs to be managed and how it needs to be run. So in other words, what we're looking for here is what does good look like? What does bad look like? What's acceptable? And this starts to lead to enabling technologies which help you to look at quality by design, for example, political techniques which are well known in the pharmaceutical industry, but have been used in many ways in the chemical industry for many, many years. It's then taking this and actually monitoring it and monitoring it in real time. So it's actually giving you live information and valuable information and actually giving you some measurement of how you're actually doing in real terms. And the control is the final part. I would say before the control, the optimization, which is a very, very important bit because this is an ongoing process. The understand monitor control continues and continues and continues. It's always a loop. You never finish. You never finish the understanding. There's always something new to understand. There'll always be new things to monitor as the business environment changes and the control will become more and more subtle. So this is just an example of the journey again. So it's really having some fixed objectives when you start the journey. So you identify those. These are some examples from the plant I've just shown you there. In each business, these will be different. And it's really trying to ask yourself hard questions. What do I need to do? How do I need to change? And getting away from this, we've always done it that way. This is the sort of things you get away from. The actions, then you need to have some specific actions. What do you really want to achieve from by this? How are you going to do it? And then also, what might that solution architecture look like? So you're looking at how these can behave, how they can interact, how they can impact your business. And to do that, you need a much more detailed needs map. And this is just an example here. So the start of this is an overall objective. The overall objective is then split down into four levers. Each of those levers is then identified with an action, so it's a mini project. It's identified the people that are required to undertake that, and also the metrics that are going to be used to measure it. So anything you do needs to be measurable, needs to be understandable. And I said at the start, people are very important to all this. So if you are going to do a digital transformation, Everybody needs to be on board. It needs to be shop floor to boardroom. Everybody needs to be taking part in it, and everybody needs to understand the benefits of it. Within this, you also need to identify barriers, things that are going to stop you achieving what you want to achieve and how you want to achieve it. If you don't come up with some stoppers and blockers to you, again, it will not be a successful transformation because there will inevitably be things that are thrown up which are unforeseen and need to be understood. And then you need to actually get to your required capabilities. What is the requirement and how do you want this to work? How do you see it work? So when we come to talk about data, people seem to think more data is more answers. The real truth in here is the right data gives the right answers. And this is where there will be a lot of difficulty in bringing projects together because industry four ties together operational technology and informational technology and the two are very very different and from an engineering point of view engineers need to understand that what they're applying and what they're doing is real so it's very very important that if you're going through data you actually validate the data that you're using so for each attribute or that's each tag if you like or each set of data you bring in you need to validate that that data is real, it contains value, and it is correct. So this is an example of a visualization. 
where we're looking at one set of parameters and looking at the skew of the distribution in there. Once we have this data, we can start to build process flow for different parameters in the process. So we look at an outcome against attributes, and we look how those attributes affect the outcome. And effectively, this allows us to build rules up. So typically, when we're looking at a process, we will look at a number of quality aspects, a number of environmental aspects, and a number of energy drive aspects. And we'll put together a model which is built using many parameters to achieve all those goals. But they're interactive and they're also weightable. So one can be driven more than the other. So if something is more important in the architectural question, it can have a higher ranking. So for example, in a powder processing plant, typically you may look at three characteristics, which are particle size on three levels. You may look at maximizing throughput to process. You may want to minimize temperature rise. So you would have models for each of those which run against others and look at how you can control that process. But they also validate the alarms you've got in that process. They also mean that you can understand if issues are going on and where those go wrong and how they go wrong. So again, these are quite valuable and they're relatively easy to do compared to first principle models. Because if you have data for inputs and data for outputs, and the outputs are correct, the inputs are got to be correct. So the system becomes a lot easier to understand. But there is another element to add to this, and that is the data doesn't tell all the story. You may need some of the holistic knowledge from Billy, who we saw at the start, who understands this process, who's worked for it for a long, long time. But on top of the data, you may also need some holistic knowledge to uh, achieve these goals. Once we've got to the stage where we get the process data, we can get a visualization, we can do a lot more with this. So what we're looking at here is a suite of tools where we can look at comparison of um, data. So here we're looking at batch to batch comparisons, see how those operate. We can produce from the data that's in here, alarms and how those alarms are managed. We can look at trending the maintenance so looking at things like bearing temperatures, oil flows, pressures, other indicators to what, what, how the, that process is working. We can also generate remote alarms. We can generate these out to remote workers, so people can have access who are not on site and maybe need that access. And the other thing is we can actually generate from the process data, quality records, process records, shift records, all automatically using that data. One of the key things with digitization is to have data entered, but use it multiple ways. So have it entered once, not multiple times, so that you can avoid the errors. Um, there are more errors by people that are entering data and missing decimal point, missing spelling something, misappropriation of a tag. These all cause major problems when you come to analytics. So visibility, once you have the data, very, very important and having a suite of tools to analyze it that are robust and reliable and repeatable is also key. So what we have achieved here is effectively in a simple way the process bot. So this is a process engineer who's available 24-7. He doesn't have holidays, he doesn't have bad days, he doesn't have time off. It's a consistent analysis, reliable analysis of the process and it's giving the best advice and the best knowledge that can be given there so in a small business this could then be rolled out so for example you've got a formulation bot quality bot distribution bot packaging bot and this can all be wrapped up into a system which gives management an overview of it but it's all taking simple bases looking at the knowledge that's within those bases how it can be applied and applied taking it and using it. So this gives you an overall vision of your business. And this is back to what we're talking about in the case study, how this became deployed. So when we look to the digital manufacturing strategy, you can see that it's split into several areas. So the PLM is the product lifecycle management system that's used. And this is a spine in the business. Feeding into that on one side of the contract manufacturing requirements from the customers, handled through in this case, Salesforce or a CRM system. 
On the other side of the PLM, we've got the data analytics and the remote monitoring feedback to do that. So we've got our scheduling and logistics in there. We've got edge analytics, anomaly and exception detection. So there's something happening, happening with the right outputs, but not the right inputs. We've got our quality records being fed into there. Our analytical records work in place and also manufacturing ones. One of the benefits of this system is everything is held at the one spot. So if everything is in one central repository. It's easy to access, it's easy to configure, and it's easy to use. But the architecture of these systems is critical. And it's going to be spe specific to your actual needs rather than somebody providing a software package with a one size fits all plan. So from where we are here now, it's really where we can go to with the digital twin. And effectively, there's three types of digital twin. So the first is one of the product. The second is one of the production process. And the third one is one of performance. And these feedback insights continuously to optimize product and production. As I said earlier, this optimization is part of a, a culture and the character change in people. It's something that goes on and on and on. It never stops, it continues to iterate. So it's very important that this is done in a very robust manner. A lot of thought goes into how these processes are designed, how the digital twins designed. So having the start in the journey and getting to digital twin, there's still quite a gap to do. And it's back to the culture of people wanting to do it and getting into this optimization routine. But typically of a digital twin, it will combine the 3D design, so you can use it for real process type display in real time. You can pair one process against another, so you can benchmark them. You can also use it for training, so a lot of these machines that are shown here can be exploded, so people can look into them and see how they're assembled, how they're disassembled, how they're packaged together. They can be used as a training aid. So a digital Win is a very, very powerful tool, but it really means you have to have a complete digital suite from the design through to the end. So something that's quite easy to achieve in a greenfield site project, quite difficult to achieve if you're using aged data. So that's a very quick journey. And I'll just leave you another little thought from Henrik von Scheele. And this is think functionally, act strategically. And Education is very, very important. Understanding the processes, understanding how they can be used, and understanding how they work is important. And it will need a change in people's mindsets so people who need that. There will be some need to collaborate with people who have got knowledge and maybe been on this journey. Because one of the keys in here is going from a complex solution to a simple solution. And this comes with clarity and experience from working. The next stage is very important build a prototype before you go for full implementation. This is something that will work and give you good insight into what you're doing, but may not be the final answer. And the equals here is this is going to be what you have to go through in each and every process. Each one, there is no one answer to. This, this whole process will change, and you need to be aware of that as we go through the process. But if you don't do this approach, it will not be successful. And it isn't known a lot of digital projects don't succeed because people don't put enough thought and enough planning into it. So the roadmap, the needs map, the measurements are all key to that. So that's it for me. Thank you. Well, thanks, Ian, for that very insightful presentation. Um, certainly one or two of those slides took me back a few years in terms of seeing some of the old control panels set against, of course, some of the, the newer ones. So thank you very much for that. So without more ado, I'd like to move on and uh, introduce Sophie. Sophie's background is in chemical engineering, and she has been at GSK for five years. During this time, she has undertaken a variety of different roles across both manufacturing and R&D, with a focus on generating process understanding of manufacturing stages in production of active pharmaceutical ingredients. Her current role is as a subject matter expert with GSK's chemicals development modeling core team. 
Her focus area is applying digital tools to reaction, liquid-liquid extraction and distillation unit operations on a variety of new chemical processes. She is also involved in the delivery of automated experimental techniques to accelerate process development work. So thank you, Sophie, over to you for your presentation. And thanks for everyone for, for joining today. So I'm going to be talking to you today about digital workflows for developing, uh, specifically looking at new chemical processes. Before I get started, uh, I just wanted to begin uh, with a few acknowledgements. Uh, so there's been uh, a lot of input uh, into the content of these slides uh, from the whole of the Chemical Development Modelling core team uh, at GSK. Uh, so we're led by George Taylor um, and our members include uh, Sandra, Neil, Batul and Suzanne who I've got on the right hand side of the screen there. We're supported by Janelle Steves within Chemical Development, um, our colleagues Marion and Simon uh, in st uh, Statistical Science. Uh, we're also supported by our system modelling um, expert team within Pharmaceutical Development, uh, Antonio and Harry. And uh, we also have contributions here from uh, Ali within Process Analytical Technology. So the first thing I really wanted to do is just to position uh, chemical development and, and what kind of things we get involved in. So uh, those of you that dialed into the previous talk in this series would have heard from uh, Dr. Caroline Lowe, who gave an overview of some of the tools that can be used in the design of a, of a target molecule, of a candidate molecule itself. In terms of what we then do in chemical development, we really get involved after that point. So when we already know what our target molecule looks like and we need to then work out how to make it. So there's three stages really within this. Uh, first of all, root selection. So looking at that target molecule and breaking it down into the intermediates we need to move through to be able to synthesize it. Once we have an idea of those building blocks, we then move on to process design. So looking at for each of those intermediates in turn, how we get from A to B and what reagents and unit operations we need to achieve that. And then finally, the last uh, area once we have that is control and optimization. So once we've selected our reagents, looking at the exact conditions we need to be picking to both give control for quality and also optimization of our process. So we can put all of that together into uh, an overall aim that we're trying to achieve in chemical development, which is designing the best process to deliver medicine for the patient. So why would we consider using digital workflows in chemical development? So a lot of this really stems from what the regulators ask of us within the pharmaceutical industry. So it's a regulatory requirement that we need to generate process knowledge to understand sources of variability and know how this variability impacts product quality so we're able to control it. However, that same process understanding which we need to generate uh, for the quality side of things can very readily be applied in exactly the same way to optimise the process for, for example, for, for yield or anything else we're interested in. So in terms of what we mean by modelling, what we're talking about there is, is using computers and simulations to describe a physical system. And as for why we do it, uh, the main reason is, is simply that resource is finite. And if we can predict the outcome of an experiment without having to do the experiment itself, then we can save resources and, and channel those into covering uh, more projects, uh, not to mention being much greener if we don't have to run the experiment in the lab. Um, which brings me on to, to talking about lab versus plant data. Uh, so I am going to be covering uh, mainly the introduction of, of new chemical manufacturing processes, uh, where often lab data is what's most readily available to us. However, both lab and plant data can be really valuable sources of process understanding. Um, the more important thing is that the data is of good quality, because models are only going to be as good as the data that underpins them. So the next thing I wanted to do is give a bit of an overview into some of the different types of models we might consider applying to our processes. There's lots of different ones which I've thrown up onto the screen there and, and there is not sort of a, a single right model that's going to be best for, for every application. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight was that these tend to fall on a bit of a scale. So on the left hand side uh, we have models which are, are very data driven and uh, are very sort of statistical in how they operate. So for example, a design of experiments. 
on the other side of the scale, we have uh, models which are more reliant on, on mechanistic understanding and first principles. So an example there would be distillation modelling, where we're driving down to really sort of predict the, the vapour liquid equilibrium within each of our separation stages. So the thing to, to highlight here is that if you have uh, a greater level of sort of that, that mechanistic understanding and that, that first principle knowledge of fundamentally what's going on in your process, you can use that um, in your modelling and perhaps uh, reduce the level of exper experimentation you might need and the amount of data you might need to reflect your process. Um, however, if your process is a little bit more complex and because of that perhaps the, the mechanistic understanding is going to be particularly challenging, then you can still apply statistical processes, um, but with a more data-driven approach, you're going to need to generate more data. So there's perhaps a, a higher experimental burden. And there's a really nice quote, which uh, a lot of people uh, involved in modeling will be familiar with, uh, which is from George Box, who's a statistician, uh, who's known a lot for his work uh, on designer experiments. And that is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And what I really mean by this is that whatever type of model you pick, there's going to be assumptions and there's going to be limitations. But if you pick the right one for the particular application you're looking for and apply it in the right way, then there can still be some, some real benefits and some real advantages to doing it. So the next thing I wanted to do was to move on and look at the, the three different stages within the chemical development life cycle and how we might be applying digital tools in, in each one. So I'm gonna start off with route selection. Uh, so what we're aiming for here is to design the best chemical route, uh, which is, of course, uh, that could be subjective as to what we mean by best, perhaps uh, the most convergent or, or the shortest. So the, the typical way of doing this at the minute would be through manual retrosynthesis. Uh, however, instead of doing this to, to disconnect the molecule, there's lots of digital tools which can be used to mine databases and use neural networks to break the molecule up for you. This will then generate some output reactions to try, and these can be ranked based on criteria which you're able to choose. So in terms of how this works, the target molecule is input along with the search criteria that you want to use to rank the options. These then pass through a retrosynthetic algorithm with the output being the reactions to try in the lab ranked for you. There's a variety of different algorithms uh, depending on the tool that you're using. Some of these could involve hand-coded rules, uh, some could use neural networks or, or chemical graphs. Uh, however, having that algorithm is really only one half of it. And the other half is being the database available to be mined and the database that's been used to train up the algorithm. The larger the database associated with the tool, uh, generally the, the more likely it is that the search is gonna be quite powerful. However, it's also important to manage expectations here. So at the moment, these tools uh, and these programs tend to throw up uh, lots of interesting ideas that can be really valuable in brainstorms to help stimulate other ideas. However, a lot of consideration from chemists is still required. And at the moment, it's, it's probably a little bit rare that an idea from a program is able to beat or, or equal the ideas of an experienced chemist. However, Algorithms and the databases they're based on really are getting better all of the time. And so this is something that does show a, a lot of promise for the future. So that's route selection. Moving on now to, to process selection. So we've defined our intermediates and how we're gonna break up our, our target molecule to synthesize it. So what we're aiming to do now is to work out what goes above the arrow. So designing the most efficient process that gives the product in the highest yield and purity. So this isn't just about the reaction step. Um, it could as well uh, be about sort of which unit operations we pick in the first place, uh, what workup we choose, whether we have any solvent swaps to move from a, a reaction solvent to a crystallization solvent. So that means we could have hundreds or thousands of different combinations of reagents, solvents and, and unit operations to try. So what we really need here is a way to reduce the size of this set to, to give us a starting point. And again, digital tools can be really useful here. So one example would be molecular modeling, uh, which is capable of predicting the transition states, um, particularly when looking at catalyzed reactions and predicting the transition states of a catalyst, uh, perhaps uh, when looking at two different stereoisomers. So looking at the variation in energy between uh, the two uh, different isomers, um, the, the one that's desired and the one that's undesired. And if we're able to 
look uh, in a digital environment at which catalysts, given energy difference between those two, it can uh, give us a few leads of which catalysts might be appropriate to, to try first. Another really powerful tool at this point is PCA, Principal Component Analysis. So this uses various uh, physiochemical properties to try and group um, classes of reagents, for example, ligands or, or bases. And this can really be applied in two ways in, in screening. Either to deliberately pick options that are likely to behave very differently. So you can make sure that with your screening, you're covering a really wide range of options uh, in a multivariate space. And that can help you identify what sorts of uh, properties are going to be useful in your reagent. The other way it can be used is if you already have uh, an insight into what kind of uh, physiochemical properties you're targeting, um, you can look specifically within a group of reagents to, to highlight options which have that set of properties that, that you might not have thought of yet. Uh, the ultimate aim of those two approaches is the same. It's to pick the best uh, reagents to try and ultimately do less experiments for being able to have that short list of options. So I've talked a lot within process selection about how we narrow down ideas, but ultimately we're still going to need to get in the lab and screen our chosen combinations. And one approach that can be really beneficial here is, is automated screening because it enables us to still get the data, but with much less of an experimental workload. And so the combination of using these digital tools to create the shortlists and then carrying out the experimentation and the screens in a high throughput way can be really powerful in accelerating process design. So moving on to, to the last stage in the chemical development life cycle, so control and optimization. So understanding where we can operate to meet uh, both our product specifications on the quality side and also uh, the optimal process conditions, uh, perhaps for, for yield or, or throughput. So what we're trying to do here is look at the process parameters. So this could be um, our reaction temperature, our amount of solvent, uh, anything we're, we're inputting into the process and relate that in some way to the output we're interested in. And that output could be um, uh, the level of an impurity um, or a manufacturability attribute, um, uh, perhaps yield. Anything that you're able to, to put a number to and quantify uh, could be suitable as an output. So what we're looking to do here is use a limited set of, of lab data to build models that can predict in a multivariate way that relationship between the inputs and the outputs. For example, if you have a reaction step, you might look at building a reaction kinetic model to predict uh, the conversion of your starting material to the product alongside the impurities you're going to form along the way. If you have an, an aqueous wash of an organic layer, you might use liquid-liquid equilibrium prediction um, to look at how both your product and your impurities are going to be partitioning between the organic and aqueous phases. If you have a solvent swap step, you might look at building a distillation model to predict the vapor-liquid equilibrium uh, in that distillation step and the resulting solvent compositions you're going to get to. And if you have a crystallization, you might look at crystallization kinetics for the impurity purging. So it's also important to be pragmatic here. Resources are, of course, finite. And the larger the number of unit operations that we want to model, the more data at stretch conditions that we'll need to generate to be able to fit the associated model parameters. And this is where some simple measurements that tell you which unit operation has the most influence on the output that you're interested in can be really useful to enable you to target your efforts. And so that's just what I wanted to highlight, that the models on this slide can be just as easily built in isolation to each other uh, along with in combination. However, if you don't have any data at all, and then you won't necessarily know where to start. One extra point to raise here is that I've chosen uh, a lot of examples on model types that are more focused on first principles. However, statistical approaches such as design of experiments are, are just as valid and certainly very commonly used in the pharmaceutical industry. So let's say uh, we're at the point now where you've put in the effort to generate some data and fit model parameters for your chosen model type. So how can this then be used to, to optimize or control your process? So the first step in this is to use the model to run lots of in silico experiments that vary all of your parameters, both on their own and in combination with each other. 
you can then use the results of this to identify which parameters are, are having a big impact on your chosen output. And, and we call these the, the CPPs, the critical process parameters. And on the other side, which parameters you, you can probably ignore and not worry about too much because they're, they're just not controlling what you're interested in. The next step is then to use that, that simplified list of process parameters um, in combination with your model to predict uh, the level of your output you're going to get across the multivariate space from varying just those critical parameters. And that can tell you what uh, combined values of those parameters is going to meet your specification or, or your yield criteria and, and what region of the multivariate space you should really be avoiding operating in. And then finally, by understanding what uncertainty you have in those model predictions, you can identify where your design or operating space needs to be to allow you to meet that specification within a certain confidence interval. So in terms of where we are currently, uh, it's quite common uh, for this to be used, uh, these modeling approaches to be used on one or two key unit operations within the process. However, there are also a few examples within the industry of in silico models being applied across multiple unit operations and, and even multiple manufacturing stages. And so while these models may be developed uh, in the R&D uh, space, uh, mainly with impurity control in mind, they can then also be handed over to the manufacturing plant as well. And there the focus might change from control of impurities uh, to optimization for yields and, and really getting that continuous feedback. And this is really exciting because it's getting very close to a, this sort of future state of, of digital twins for manufacturing, uh, which Ian has touched upon as well in his talk. Uh, and with these digital twins, you can run thousands of experiments at the touch of a button, fully describing the system and, and what's going to happen uh, within your plant equipment. However, it's important to remember that a digital twin will only model the data that you've put in. And the more effects the include that you include when you build your digital twin, the more you'll get out of it. Uh, but on the other side, the, the more resource you'll need to build it in the first place. So because of that, it's probably commonplace at the moment to focus effort on uh, the process parameters. But for a digital twin to be fully representative of the plant scale, uh, the equipment effects relating to heat and mass transfer will, will definitely need to be considered too. Um, and so uh, the advice here would be that you can build something that's all singing and all dancing, but it could well be incredibly complex. So if you've got a specific question you're trying to answer using digital tools, then perhaps focus on what you're interested in. And some simple bits of information could help narrow down your efforts and, and give you an idea of where you need to be focusing. So far, I've given an overview of how digital tools can be applied at each stage of the chemical development life cycle. But what if it was possible in, in the future to bring together everything across these uh, different stages into one integrated platform? We could use retrosynthesis software to predict options for the chemical route and link it to an automated platform that could run the experiments to test that route with process analytical technology available to collect the data. That best route would then be taken forward into process design where digital tools would generate the short list of reagents for high throughput experimental screening, again with online data analysis. The integrated platform would also predict the solubility of your, your target product molecule in various solvents and design the distillation steps and the vapor liquid equilibrium needed to move from the reagent to the crystallization solvent. That best process is then taken forward and the impurities that could be generated from it predicted. The correct tools needed to accurately model those impurities are selected and uh, identified for all your various different unit operations. This integrated platform then designs the experiments needed to fit the model parameters and run these in an automated and perhaps even a, a self-optimizing way using each iteration of the parameter fitting to adjust the conditions and deliver a final process. So this feature state is probably quite a, a big leap at the moment, uh, which is not a bad thing as it would do us all out of a job. Uh, but it's exciting to consider the potential that digital tools could have if we find a way uh, to, to link them together. So to summarize, although this feature state uh, is a way off yet, hopefully I've demonstrated today that digital tools can be readily applied across all stages of the chemical development process with some real advantages. Whilst the ultimate aim in the future may be to bring these together, Picking specific digital tools to help solve a challenge can be really beneficial uh, in accelerating the development of new manufacturing processes. 
And just to return to George Box one last time, whilst all of these models are wrong in one way or another, if applied correctly, they can most definitely be useful. So that was everything I had to cover today. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I'll hand back to Will now for the Q&A session. Thanks, Sophie. That was great. It's, it's good to see the ambition there around the, uh, around the future of uh, digital twins. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, she will get some interesting questions on that one. <laughs> um, so just whilst the final questions are being put in and um, you, you're having a chance to do that and uh, Tom is compiling them for me, then uh, just let's go through a few um, future bit, um, future opportunities at um, the Society for Chemical Industry. So the next in this series of talks, um, this webinar on the, is on the 21st of October, which will be the digital design of life cycles, where we go on to tracking materials along the whole supply chain. Also coming up in November and very pertinent in this um, time of COVID-19, um, the chemistry and resource efficiency of PPE. I think a lot of work's been done putting emergency PPE together for every, everybody from shopkeepers to hospitals and everything in between. Um, and we've not had to worry too much about how those equipments are going to be, pieces of equipment are going to be recycled or reused in the future. And it's time to stop and have a look at that now. And then some of the lectures in the SCI talk series, we have Dr. Ruth McKernan, um, the quest for effective dementia treatments on the 30th of September, the 28th of October, Professor Carol Mundell, Big Bangs and Black Holes, Frontiers of Space Science in the Real Real Time World. That sounds as though it could be exciting. And then on the 25th of November, Professor Liz Socket, Combating Antimicrobial Resistance Bacteria Using Predatory Bidello Vibrio. I hope we got that right. I've never seen that word before. Anyway, um, some things to look forward to in the future. And uh, perhaps now we're ready to um, to move on to questions. Yes, uh, thanks, Will. I've got a um, first question for you here. Um, just a reminder to everyone, we haven't got that many questions that have come through. So uh, please do continue to send them through and, and we'll add those onto the end. Um, so first question here uh, for Ian. Um, so Ian, you said that there's a perception that digital transformations cost a lot of money. Um, why do people think that this is and what sort of costs are actually involved in getting started? Okay, so I think the reason that people perceive the cost to be high is most of the solutions that are that are touted around typically are quite expensive as software solutions to start with. They're also quite intensive from an effort point of view in terms of what you've actually got to add to those solutions. Um, it very much depends on what you're trying to digitise and what you're trying to look at, and how you're going to go about it as, as for that. So without knowing specifics of it, it's hard to say. In, in terms of costs, again, you know, it's very difficult to put a cost against something. But I mean, you know, simple solutions can be put together for, you know, sort of a few thousand pounds. That they can increase up to several hundreds of thousands of pounds, depending how complicated they are. So it, it really is understanding the scale of the process, what you're trying to achieve out of it, and what's available to start with, I guess, would be my take on that. Okay, thanks Ian. Um, I've got another question here, um, which could, I think, could probably apply, ask to Sophie, but could probably apply to both. Um, how can an SME access these sorts of tools? So, I guess my advice there would be to see if there's a particular question that, that you're looking to use these digital tools to address and therefore to what degree you're, you're looking to, to implement digital tools because if a, there's a specific question or a specific challenge that you're looking to focus on um, then you may not necessarily require something sort of uh, all singing or dancing um, and sort of simple software packages which enable you to, to build um, a, a model of your process um, based on a select set of data may get you um, a, a large uh, degree of the way there. Um, if you're looking at something perhaps more more comprehensive, um, then I'll probably have to have to pass over to Ian and see if you've got any thoughts on that. 
I mean, I guess my advice would be is if you are starting a journey on this, as I said, in it, it's worth talking to people who are working in this area. So high value manufacturing catapult, they've got a number of people who are experts in different areas. The MMIC, which has been formed recently, which again has a lot of expertise in this area. So I think it's seeking advice, you know, of what your challenge is. It's defining what your challenge is and what you're trying to achieve. And that will probably start to point you in the right direction. Um, you know, on a simple basis, it could be just engaging with what the government's brought in as the Made Smarter initiative and what they're doing there. You know, talking to some of their consultants can point you in the right direction to start with. So there's a number of routes, but it's really difficult to advise without knowing what the specific challenge is. Okay, thank you. Perhaps a, a follow-up question here then, um, Sophie. Can can these tools be applied to polymers? So a different specific application there. Oh, that's a that's a tricky question for me. Um, so, so my experience is is very much we're within the pharmaceutical industry, um, but I'm sure there are modelling tools out there um, for aspects of polymer processing, um, and I I may not uh, just not be familiar with them, um, but certainly um, if you're you're able to find a, a modelling package and you're able to uh, collect the data on your process about how varying uh, the inputs uh, can uh, deliver changes to your outputs, um, then there's no reason, uh, especially for some of the more statistical processes, um, that you wouldn't be able to um, address the questions uh, that you're trying to, to answer. Um, so I guess certainly the statistical approaches where you're just looking at relating inputs to outputs um, there's no reason I can see why, as long as you can measure the inputs and the outputs, you wouldn't be able to build at least a, a statistical model to reflect that. And the bit I'm not so sure of is on, on the more mechanistic first principle side of things, uh, what tools are out there. Um, but it's always worth a look. Do we have any okay, more there? Thank you. Yeah, um, a slightly longer question here, um, which, uh, Will, you might want to comment on as well. Um, so this question asked here, um, for Ian says, you mentioned that many SMEs and some larger companies are still striving to achieve that industry 3.0 level. Um, are funding programs which focus on cutting edge applications such as Made Smarter going to provide enough of a trickle down type effect for those companies still lagging behind? Or does there need to be a shift in focus if we're going to see levelling up uh, promised by the government? Want me to start on that one, Will? Just... Yeah, please. Um, right, it's quite a political question, um, and I think sort of from what I've seen is there's been a lot of non-investment in the UK over the years in, in process plant generally, in infrastructure and all sorts of things. And the reason for that is there hasn't been any real encouragement for people to invest because a lot of the capital tax incentives that were there were reduced over the years. So people have tended to run assets and use that phrase sweat assets, run them into the ground. Um, what that's meant now is that the UK has got quite aged systems, quite aged processes. Whereas if you look at say Germany and Italy, where they've had investment programs over sort of five year periods and have recycled and reinvested, it's very easy for them to transform their processes and become much should there be a different strategy? Personally, I believe there should be a different strategy. I think there should be incentives for investment, especially with the times we're going into at the moment. I think made smart as a start. I think that, that's some very good things can be done from that, but obviously the pilot's only running in the Northwest at the moment, and it's not available throughout the whole country yet. Again, at the moment, it's limited in the size of projects it takes and looks at. It is not really focused on capital, and I think a lot of the issues here are around aged assets which need investment, which is capital investment. So I think, yes, there needs to be a change. Yeah, I, I can give um, an example of an issue coming up in, in the pharmaceutical industry, really, and it's around, um, it, it's around the fact that because our manufacturing hasn't stayed competitive, we've done a lot of offshoring in the past. And so a lot of the materials made, made overseas, China and India particularly, and um, during the COVID period, um, those supply chains have got broken and there have been shortages of key drugs. And uh, there's, a, there's a, 
a feeling in the UK and there's a similar feeling in the US now that we, we have to start reshoring some of those drugs. Now, in the first place, you do it because you've got to and you do it the way you always did it in the past. Um, and that is probably, for instance, using a batch process with very little automation and control. But if you think about the reason we offshored in the first place, it was we had uncompetitive processes. So over time, we've got to correct that. So we need to be moving towards um, bio-enabled processes, continuous processes, digitally automated processes. And, and, and that's going to be the imperative to keep us there and to keep us um, competitive in the future. And actually, that applies to the SMEs around. A lot of SMEs provide um, contract manufacturing um, equipment for the larger pharmaceutical companies and larger specialty chemical companies. So it's equally relevant, I think, to both. It's, it's going to be an imperative, in, in other words, to um, to have more efficient processes. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, perhaps more of a, a comment than a question from an SCI perspective. So SCI are going to be setting up a, an interest group as a as a community to share knowledge and accelerate adoption of AI, data and digitalization in chemistry using business as a follow-up to these this series of webinars. What do you think is the one biggest challenge in this area that that group should tackle? So if we do, do you want to pick that one up first? <laughs> yep, uh, I can try to at least. Um, I'm trying to have a think about it. Um, so I guess from my perspective as well, um, looking at, at new processes, um, it's the balance between how you get the all the new digital, uh, digitalization tools which you might think about when you're developing a new process and then balancing that uh, with an existing manufacturing plant where you've got uh, perhaps older equipment um, which doesn't necessarily um, have um, all, all the monitoring and digital tools in place and matching kind of those expectations of, of wanting to introduce these tools and especially if you've got a new process which you're able to, to do the research work uh, to develop them on but then balancing that with ultimately it's got to reside in a manufacturing plant and and the two have to have to meet in the middle somewhere thank you ian have you got anything on that one any thoughts i, I think one of the things that really does need to be considered is how you approach these processes projects and but almost there should be sort of you almost need a standard methodology of how you go about it and almost in some cases there should be some standards around sort of day to day to preparation how you actually achieve the goals what processes you go through I mean, Sophie's got working in a very very heavily regulated industry so they've got a lot of challenges which are different to people who are manufacturing and it could be a bulk component it doesn't go into food or that so I think there's got to be sort of some standards brought around different things. And I think methodologies and how digital happens is quite an important one. Um, I think also it's understanding when people talk about AI, there's probably about 30 different types of AI, and it's really using the right types of AI that are appropriate to the application. So it may be even looking at limiting the AI that you use in certain industries because of the safety aspects and how it's used. So I think there's quite a lot of work to do there. It's still early days in general adoption. Yeah, and if, if I'd add one overarching thing, it's, it, it's you, I think you, you both touched on it in your talks, but we pull together an awful lot of data, but it's, it's using the best analytics you possibly can to analyze that data and get the most useful conclusions out of it, which, um, which is an area, I mean, it's great actually, because it's something for the mathematicians again to get at and, you know, to give us some very usable um, algorithms for doing doing data analytics. And, um, you know, I think there's, there's some big challenges there. Thank you very much. Thanks for everybody's uh, comments there, some food for thought. Um, just to say that if anybody is interested in that um, future activity from SCI, that, that interest group, then um, there'll be a pop-up survey, which will appear after the, the webinar closes. And if you just take a minute to complete that, then that's an expression of interest there. Um, so the next question we've got here um, is for Sophie. Um, so I don't know whether you'll be able to comment on this, but um, there's been a question which asks, how close are you at GSK to developing a full digital twin for plant processes, which you have been modeling? 
Uh, oh gosh. Um, it's a tricky one to answer, I guess, because there's there's a few different um, approaches uh, to digital twins and a few different definitions of what sort of we mean by a full digital twin. Um, and it's almost sort of a, a, a never ending question because there's always uh, an additional effect that you could model, uh, uh, an additional sort of layer of detail you could build. Um, and sort of at, at what point do you, do you call that um, a, a full sort of digital twin? Um, so I'd say we, uh, it's quite commonplace, uh, both at GSK and also within the pharmaceutical industry to be looking at um, an, an in silico model for unit operation. Um, and perhaps where we're at the stage where we can start joining some of those unit uh, operations together. Um, but whether we're at the point yet where we're fully describing uh, all every single effect going on in the system and at what point um, you say you've described enough of the effects that it's sufficient as a digital twin. Um, I think that's uh, an interesting question which uh, we're probably still exploring a bit. Okay thanks Sophie. Um, I think we've got one more question here um, that might be at the moment um, which is for Ian. So follow up to um, one of the earlier questions about um, SMEs. Um, the question asks, what organisations are there to advise SMEs um, on digital transformations without selling to them? So I think looking for some kind of impartial advice there. Well, I, I would say realistically, um, as Made Smarter goes out, that's probably the first point. That would be the first point of call because, again, they can point people in different directions as they're going through it. Um, Certainly, any of the high value manufacturing catapults that are appropriate to your area of business or the processes you're looking at are, are good. Um, it's very difficult to get agnostic advice, I'd say, because everybody's got the perfect tool and everybody's got the, the, the solution that you need now. Um, my question to them always is, well, show me. Show me something that you've, you've worked on, something that you've done to do that. And I'd always use that as a start point. Um, I think. People who genuinely do understand this field will say, I need to think about it, I need to have a look at it, and everybody thought about it. But certainly I would say really, you know, it's got to be looking at high value manufacturing catapults. Some of the LEPs in different areas of the country have got um, good experience. Um, certainly, you know, Liverpool with LCR4, Manchester with its arts. Lancashire with what it's doing now, they've all got quite good advisory services available. So that's another possibility. But um, Manufacturers Alliance, people like that, again, are quite useful. So there are a number. Okay, thank you. I think that's about it for the for the questions we've got so far, Will. Unless you've got any any further. Okay, well, let me let me. I've got it. I've got one for each of the speakers lined up, just in case. So let me let me start with one anyway. Um, and this is for Sophie, and it sort of touches on your talk it, it, to one stage of it anyway. But I've heard it said that um, because when you start developing a process in the pharmaceutical company, the first thing that this process chemist goes to is a batch process, and you you, you learn it in batch, and therefore it, it almost inevitably gets um, gets commercialised as a batch reaction. And um, that's one of the reasons why cluttered around the UK now we've got an awful lot of unused batch. Um, processes, batch equipment for for the pharmaceutical industry, and indeed, I could say the same thing applies to specialty chemicals. But have you got a th any thoughts on that? Are you seeing any change there in terms of how reactions are initially looked at when you take them to reactors? So, I guess the the challenge with that as well is that when we first look at manufacturing the molecule, we're in the we're in the sort of very early stages of clinical trials, perhaps. And so the volume that we need to manufacture is inherently quite a small volume where we wouldn't necessarily consider a, a continuous process because it's, it's just not required. Um, so certainly it is a challenge that you then start off fundamentally with, with a batch process. Um, and when you're conducting lab experiments, much more uh, straightforward um, for, for a lab chemist if you, if you have a, a batch process. Um, which you can then do sort of small scale experiments on uh, in the lab. So 
what we'd normally consider, I would say, as to whether we're running in batch or continuous is really, is there a driver for from what the science is telling us for that particular process or for what the project is um, a, a big driver for running in continuous? So, for example, um, perhaps a, a certain reaction step uh, which generates an impurity in a batch process, which you can completely eliminate in the continuous process, then there's a really strong driver for um, introducing that continuous process. Um, or perhaps um, on the volume side of things, so if it's a, a particularly high volume product that uh, we're looking uh, to manufacture, then you can see all the uh, perhaps efficiency savings you might generate uh, from a continuous process rather than a batch. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you, I guess, that a batch is perhaps still, still seen as the de default and maybe a, a bit of a shift in mindsets is required uh, if we want to change that. Thank you. Thanks for that. Tom, has anything else come in while I, before I ask my other one? Uh, no, I think you go ahead, Will. Okay, right. This one's for Ian. And it, it really goes back to it. early in your talk, you mentioned um, that the, um, the actual progress to um, Industry 4.0 wasn't going as quickly as people had projected initially, and we're probably in 2020, where we're projected to be in 2016 or something like that, I think you'd say. And um, I just wondered, is, was that an international view or a UK view? And what, what, do, you th what do you think, where do you think we are, if you like? Okay, so that statistic was particularly from the UK. Okay. It came from Cambridge University's Institute for Manufacturing. And some survey and some work they did there. Um, from what I understand, and from working sort of more internationally previously, I think digital is quite a way behind. I think there's some countries which are well ahead and some industries which are well ahead and others that are, are lagging behind. And I think part of the challenge in all this is it's a change in mindset for people. There's a lot of people, knowledge is power. When you start to go to digital, that knowledge has got to be shared. It's got to be more open. That more people contributing contributing to it um, and I think that change is quite difficult and that's quite slow to bring about in a lot of industries and it's also um, I'm sure Sophie's aware of this when you go more and more into R&D things collaborative r and is talked about more and more but the amount of collaborative R&D that's done at the moment is relatively small but beginning to increase and I think it's this trust between companies and other organizations how they go which brings it about and I think, as I say, in the UK, probably it's this investment profile which is holding digital back at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I think it, I, I would support that. I mean, investing in productivity is uh, is something that it's never been as exciting as investing in a new product, and people are very happy to invest in the development of a new product. Less, um, less inclined to invest in how can I radically improve the productivity of my process. Okay, it, have we anything else, Tom? Uh, no, I think if you'd just like to close us out, I think that's... I just, um, in that case, I'll thank everybody for, thank our speakers particularly for, for two very insightful talks. I thank our um, audience for their time and attention here. And just as one favour for you all, if you wouldn't mind filling in the questionnaire before you, um, before you sign off, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks everybody, goodbye.